what was the point of going through, you know, so much mental and physical labor to set up my own shop to to run a business? If if I was not liking it, if it what if it became not fun at the end of the day, what's the point? Listeners of the podcast can get a free sticker. All you have to do is leave a written review for the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Take a screenshot of your review and email it to me along with your mailing address to marisuelena at gmail.com. Or you can also DM me on Instagram at marisuelena or at Tending Creativity with the same info and I'll mail you a free sticker. Welcome to the Tending Creativity podcast. Tending Creativity is a podcast about creativity, art, and life where I interview artists and creatives of marginalized genders as well as talk about my experience as a creative and related topics. My name is Marissa. I'm the host. And for today's episode, we have an interview with Ruby Wardis, who is the creator and designer of Shop Rudy, an ethical clothing brand. Shop Rudy creates fun, colorful designs, most notably dresses, but other items as well. And like I said, they're super fun and whimsical pieces. And the creator Ruby takes inspiration from the fashion history of counterculture and the quote, intersection of political messaging and personal style, unquote. I got to talk to her about how she started Shop Rudy during the pandemic and eventually left her full-time job as a producer in film and TV to run Shop Rudy. Um, talk to her about her process, a bit about fashion history and her influences, as well as her upcoming fall 2022 collection. I learned a lot talking to Ruby and I really enjoyed my conversation with her and I'm sure that you will too. Thank you again, Ruby, for being on the podcast and speaking to me. Um, I was hoping that we could just start with you introducing yourself and what you do. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Ruby Wardis, and I run a slow fashion brand called Rudy. Um, some people find that confusing that my name is Ruby and the brand is Rudy, but <laughs> we push through it. Um, I have been, the brand has been around since around October of last year. Um, and it's all based off of the history of counterculture. You know, it's quite feminine, but cool and casual. And I like to incorporate a lot of fashion history into the stories behind my products. Cool, cool. So um, before we actually start talking more about your shop, I did want to ask you a little bit more about your like childhood as far as basically what was your relationship with creativity and yeah. like, arts and crafts growing up? Definitely. Um, I was always an arty kid, for sure. Um across multiple disciplines. Um, I was, uh, you know, doing lots of drawing. I did dance classes forever. Um, my parents um, are punk rockers. So I was always in the music scene. Like I, I did this camp called the Willie Mays Rock and Roll Camp for Girls. And um, you oh, would like learn cool. to play an instrument and, <laughs> and form a band. Um, did that at probably ages like nine, 10 and 11. Um, loved it. Uh, and then as a teenager, I was not particularly well behaved in school or otherwise. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of that time grounded, honestly. <laughs> and that is where I sort of refound creativity, not just as like a child. I was you know, home on Friday nights and I wasn't allowed my phone or whatever. And I actually really kind of cherished those moments. And I would start, you know, painting a wall in my room or putting together a comic book or, you know, X, Y, and Z. So, um, yeah, um, I've always definitely loved creativity. And I think that my hobbies have um, always kind of straddled creativity and like a tactile technical element. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I always say I have old lady hobbies of sewing and baking <laughs> and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of love that you can separate the right brain, left brain, you know, you're, you're focusing technically on what you need to do and there's sort of like technical skill involved. Um, but you can be creative as you go. I was never 
totally comfortable in a medium that was a hundred percent creative. It needed to have something sort of technical as well. Um, but then I would be bored by something purely technical. So, um, Mm. I think sewing, yeah, that, that ended up being my thing. Yeah. I was always an arty kid. My parents were super supportive. They're like, you know, hung up my art on the refrigerator and I am grateful for that for sure. Yeah, cool. Did you, I know you're in LA right now. Did you grow up in LA? No, I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, So a lot of my friends, parents were kind of in the same scene as my parents. So we had younger parents and, you know, they're all tattooed and, you know, my friend's mom was in a band. So we would go, we were little kids sitting in the back of the concert venue, like, um, you know, drinking Shirley Temples and stuff like that. So, (laughs) um, yeah. That's cool. I personally, like for me growing up, I had like pretty strict parents, but I did have friends who like their parents. I remember this one kid, his dad was like a guitarist and he would like grow up going to like shows and stuff. And I was always so jealous. Like, uh, I wish uh, I had your experience. Um, yeah, it sounds super cool. But eventually as I got older, I was able to go do that stuff on my own. But it seems it's always like interesting to me when people got to have that like immersion growing up. Yeah. I mean, my parents were, um, you know, I've sort of dealt with this my whole life of people thinking that my parents are very cool because of the industry that they work in or the way that they look. But to me, they're just my parents. Yeah, you know, I'm like, yeah. what are you talking about? They're so lean. <laughs> um, and, you know, they were like I said, I was grounded a lot. So they were quite strict um, mm-hmm. in some ways. Like, you know, I got, I, I, they weren't, I wasn't um, one of those. I certainly had friends that were, you know, kind of doing whatever they wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I was trying to hang out with those kids and do whatever they wanted. And then my parents were like, who do you think you are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Um, cool. So oh, now I want to kind of get into like how you got started with your shop um yeah when did you actually start sewing because you you learned pretty recently right before starting the shop I have only been sewing clothing Mm -hmm. since the last in the last year and a half I would say I've been I I learned to sew as a kid um my grandmother was quite into it we would make little pillows and quilts and One of my earliest pandemic hobbies was decorating the house and, um, you know, painting accent walls. And, you know, I think we were all trying to find new hobbies and figure out what we like to do. And so I started making throw pillows sort of obsessively. Um, That became my therapy, really. And um, so I was doing lots of hand sewing. And then I was like mending clothes and putting patches on things and ended up getting my partner a sewing machine because he worked in the fashion industry and I will say that uh this is sort of backtracking a little bit but I always loved fashion as a kid and as a teenager but I never I didn't know anyone that did that as a job and Mm -hmm. I didn't really think that that was a world I wanted to go in into because I just didn't know that much about it and I ended up finding film and television as my as my as my thing. I went to film Mm. school. Um, I guess I first started as like a theater student and then ended up on the film side. And then, um, yeah. So, so fashion was something that was just one of my side projects. And I started to get back into it in the pandemic because, you know, you're going to the grocery store once every two weeks and it's your opportunity to like put on an outfit. (laughs) It's just quite exciting. Um, and got getting more experimental and, you know, I, I think I certainly dulled my shine a little bit working in the television industry, wearing sort of like a crew uniform, you know, wanting to be taken seriously as a producer. And, you know, I was always the youngest person in the room. So I really wanted to be taken seriously um, by just sort of, you know, wearing all black and I would wear my cardigan every day and or my blazer. And um, I was I, I sort of equated bright colors and patterns and like a flounciness to a childlike person. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to be seen as that. So it wasn't until the pandemic when I was home alone that I was able to kind of start dressing like that and think, you know, I think a lot of us were thinking, what do I like? What do I like to eat? What time do I like to go outside? You know, um, that kind of thing. 
So I, like I said, I was sewing things around the house. I was doing lots of painting, um, various arts and crafts as my roommate. And I watched hours and hours of Love Island, you know, just <laughs> passing the time. Um, and my, like I said, my partner worked in fashion. So he was the first person that I knew. He works in like a luxury men's fashion. And so uh, I got him a little sewing machine because he was repairing something of his. I think he was hemming some pants and I got them as a gift. And then I was the one using it all the time, all of a sudden. <laughs> and then I started, I don't know, just practicing with different things. And I got a little bit more, I wanted to go to mood like they do on Project Runway. Mm -hmm. I don't know. If yeah, you I was going to ask yeah. you if you had, I used to watch Project Runway a lot. Oh my God, too. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, I just started experimenting and then started making clothes and I was just making clothes for myself, but I'm sort of an obsessive hobbyist. So I was doing it a lot, many hours. And all of a sudden I had a rack of things in my closet that were mine. And I was like, I'm not wearing all these tentatively posted on my personal Instagram. Like, Hey, would anyone want to buy this? Haha. <laughs> I don't know. Just cover the cost of materials. I'm spending so much money on fabric. Um, and then there was some interest. So I thought maybe I'll put together a little website and it sold out on the first day. So that, and then I sort of blacked out and it's been my entire life <laughs> since then, which I'm so fortunate and lucky and excited um, to be there. And it, and it really took my, my partner, um, you know, showing me what, what that world looks like. And, um, you know, he was someone that works in fashion who was able to say, no, you, I mean, I didn't know anything about designers. I didn't know any mm -hmm. of that. That's what I thought that industry was. But he was like, no, you have good style. You know, that's what it is. Yeah, I think a lot of people come around to, you know, maybe artists are the same way too, like fine artists. You um, start doing what's fun and then you get into all these techniques and you understand all these artists. And then you kind of have to come full circle to be like, no, art is actually you drawing and, you know, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter the technique. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how the brand started. Cool. That's super interesting. I didn't even realize that you had been in like the TV and film industry beforehand. I don't know how much you're comfortable talking about that, but I was just wondering, like you said that, you know, once the pandemic happened, you were home, um, did leaving that industry, was that like just because of like the pandemic and not having work or that was a personal choice? No. Um, yeah, I, I'm comfortable talking about all that stuff for sure. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think how to tie it into creativity, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, well, it actually did start with creativity. That was sort of my scene in college was the like improv team mm. and sketch comedy. Um, I just loved that stuff so much. I was a big Saturday Night Live nerd growing up. <laughs> um, yeah, that, you know, Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, that was like, my parents were into music. So comedy kind of became my thing that was yeah, just yeah. fine um and so like I said I ended up going to film school and um but I wasn't a very serious film person you know there were some people there that would they were quite serious they loved their Tarantino <laughs> and all that which don't get me wrong I like the Tarantino now and again um but no I was very into comedy and more television so um I started doing internships at late night tv shows in both LA and New York. And then I worked for a talent agency at a desk, um, just sort of typing away in my aforementioned blazer. Um, <laughs> and then I just kind of stayed in touch with, um, with some people from my internships and one of the late night hosts, um, has like a production company as they also produce TV. So, um, I joined that company as an assistant and then was promoted through there. So actually when, when the pandemic hit, I was, my bag was literally packed to fly to Portland to shoot a pilot. And it was like a big promotion for me was mm. that I was being sent there to be the producer on set. I was very excited, but I was very stressed all the time. And I was watching every other network besides ours cancel shoots. And I was like, we were the very last ones. And I'm sitting there, you know, on Friday, March 13th or whatever it was. And just yeah. like, 
are we insane? Like, are we supposed to, there's no food at the Trader Joe's. Am I supposed to really fly? Yeah. <laughs> fly to Portland. Um, so that job, when the pandemic hit, I, I kept it because I worked for a company. I was a salaried employee. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. I guess my job was very administrative, um, budgeting and spreadsheets and contracts and things like that. Um, which I didn't mind so much when it was also involved with like, you know, you're in Hollywood, you're, Mm -hmm. you're going to events and you're going to comedy shows. And I was going to shows constantly and, and it felt sort of shiny. And then when the pandemic hit, my job was sort of whittled away to what it actually was Mm -hmm. without the shininess to distract you, you know? And Mm -hmm. I realized that it was just not really fulfilling me in that time. Um, and I, you know, loved the company that I worked for. It was quite small. We were all very close. Um, but I just found myself finding more, more fulfillment out of my hobbies. And I just learned a lot about myself over that time as we all did. So I actually did Rudy as a side business for as long as I possibly could before quitting because I was afraid, but then (laughs) I thought, you know, I could have one foot in and one foot out forever. I could kind yeah. of balance forever. And I needed, I mean, I was fortunate enough to be in a situation where I was able to save a little bit of money, but I I needed to throw myself in the deep end or else I was going to Stay kind of exist in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Um, that's super interesting. I didn't, I, that was going to be one of my questions too, like, if you had quit and then um, like dove into Rudy or if you quit like after being having that the shop for a while. So, yeah, that's no, I think true. I overlapped probably by like six months full time, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And that's a lot of work, like because and like initially when you were working your full time job and doing um, shop Rudy was basically, would you say like basically your free time was mostly devoted to your shop? Definitely, definitely. And you know, when there wasn't much to do, people weren't going out that, you know, I was happy to use that free time. And also every once in a while, my day job would be slow and I would have time Mm -hmm. to, you know, I'm listening to a conference call and I'm pinning fabric on my lap at the same time. Um, And then it wasn't until it, you know, became a real thing that I just thought, you know, I, I just don't have time. And I think I, I think sometimes when you're, okay, so this is something interesting that I've thought about a lot, which is actually some advice I got from another producer. Um, mm-hmm. And it talks about, he was talking about if you are the kind of person that's a very creative person and you have creative, uh, you know, occupational aspirations, but you also are quite good at, something else that's not very creative. So let's say, I don't know, you're, you want to be a film director, but also you're quite a good producer and executive at the, and you don't really know which one, which path to go down his advice. And maybe this is somewhat antiquated from the before times of not really respecting your leisure time, but his advice was to just do both as hard as you can. And eventually one of them is going to take over the other one. And you will just know, like you naturally prioritize in your, in your mind. So, so it's, you know, I was finding myself, I mean, maybe dreading is too intense of a word, but not thinking too much about my job and focusing more on my side business. And it, it, my, my natural prioritization of that made it very clear that um, that's what I, it wasn't just a phase. Mm-hmm. So at what point from you kind of realizing or starting to think about like, oh, this is what I need to prioritize. I think I should probably quit my job to focus um, on Shop Rudy. From that like point of thinking about that, how long was it then until you did quit? Did you kind of like make a plan for yourself or how did oh my that God, go? No, I was so afraid <laughs> to quit. Mm-hmm. I was so afraid. Um, you know, I mean, afraid of 
you know, obviously like the financial consequences, it becomes very much in your own hands to be able to pay your bills. But also I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Like, like I said, we were a small company and I didn't want to, I don't know. I thought, I thought uh, I spent all this money on it. I'm still paying off the loans from a film degree and now I'm mm-hmm. doing something different. Like I just, you know, I made a million excuses and reasons to be anxious about it, which I, I, maybe they're not excuses. They're probably quite valid. But um, I had a um, benchmark of the amount of money that I wanted to save. That's how I made the decision. Um, and I knew that once I got there, I would say, OK, I just need two thousand mm-hmm. more dollars. Actually, I'll do it. After, let me get one more paycheck. Let me do one more. So I had to really draw a line in the sand. But um, it's actually kind of a funny story that the day that I quit both my car and my partner's car were stolen. Uh. <laughs> and um, I was like, is this a sign from the universe? Slash, how am I going to pay for this? Yeah. Um, but it didn't deter me. So maybe that means something. But we ended up finding the car, so it was fine. <laughs> oh, okay. That's good. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Both of them yeah, on the I same Yeah, I literally um, like, was on the phone with my boss, and I put in, I gave him a month's notice to try mm-hmm. to be as like easy for them as possible. And I come out into the living room and I'm like sort of teary and I hug my partner and he's like, I'm so proud of you. And he looks out over my shoulder out the window and he goes, where are our cars? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Like straight out of a movie. Yeah. (laughs) That's funny. Cool. So then, um, once you did quit, what, what was maybe like that first month like of just focusing on sharp beauty? Yeah. Um, well, so my last day was a Thursday. Um, I think it was just like the end of the month or something. And so that Friday morning, so I've been making everything myself. And mm-hmm. for my as the business has grown, I've decided to start working with a small factory here in L.A. Um, and I had my first meeting with them at 10 a.m. My first day of of not working at my old TV job. So I really thought I was going to hit the ground running and I, you know, woke up early and I went to my first real in-person meeting as like a, someone who now works in the fashion industry. Um, and I came home and I had this big to-do list and I was, you know, listening to a business podcast and just sewing away. And it, it was around like one o'clock. I just was like, I'm so tired. <laughs> I need to stop. And mm-hmm. I need to like just relax and yeah. it's okay to take the rest of the day, the weekend. Maybe I should take a week in between and just do nothing because burning out is really real. <laughs> and so, yeah. yeah, I think I, my, my plan for that first month was to be an absolute hashtag girl boss. But <laughs> the reality was that I needed to rest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely, um, because I I quit my job in like January. And oh my gosh, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm not even, I kind of had the same deal where it was like, I kept making excuses. Um, but for me, like, I felt like it was, it's more precarious because I didn't really have like other income streams when I quit. Yeah. But it was really hard for me to build that up while I was working. And then I did kind of like end up burning out. I had been there for like five years Mm -hmm. and I had like, you know, mental health problems. And so like I worked for a school when we came back from winter break, I was like, after winter break, I'll be able to like, at least make it to the end. There's always another. Yeah. Yeah. Make it to the end. Like actually one more. Yeah. And then like that week back, I was like, I just couldn't. Um, like yeah. it, it really got to that point for me. So then like when I quit, you know that feeling where you're like, you pull up your car to your work and then you're sitting in your car in the parking lot and you can't get out of your car to go in the yeah. building. I mean, that <laughs> yeah. had literally like happened to me, like a few years into the job, like I had called off before, like when I was parked in front and just yeah. like drove home. So like, <laughs> Good for you. yeah, when I quit, I decided to like take, you know, a few weeks to just like chill and I think it's it, so like, important it really helped and even now like I'm trying to like you know like you said tackle my to-do list and stuff but I have to remind myself like I'm trying to go for like a long game so 
make yes. sure you get that rest in. Totally. And honestly, I realized that if I was going to be like a tyrannical boss to myself, and if I was going to make things really hard, what was the point mm-hmm. of going through, you know, so much mental and physical labor to set up my own shop to to run a business if if I was not liking it if it what if it became not fun at the end of the day what's the point you know might as well get uh, you know a tech job and or you know whatever and then work for the weekend because if you're going to do something on your own which I'm sure you, you know too like it's, it's a lot of hard work, but you got to make it worth it for yourself. You have to enjoy it. Otherwise, what's the point? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So what did you do for those weeks that you took off? Did you just um, like lay around? <laughs> That's what I yeah, did. pretty much. Like, so I, I can't even think. I just like took walks. Yeah, I took um, a lot of walks and listened to podcasts, watched TV, and like hung out with my family just and veg out their dog yeah yeah it was it was nice that did you really nice. did you have any um leisure like specific leisure activities you enjoyed doing during, during I your can't time even remember so i recently took my first ever vacation for mm-hmm leisure purposes like I've done trips every now and again that are like you know we go to a city and doing lots of walking around and museums and stuff like that but I had never like just gone to the beach for a week um so uh this is probably not the best financial decision but I went to Hawaii with two friends and um it was the first time I went somewhere where I was like the only thing we have to do here is get a cocktail in a hollowed out pineapple and sit for the rest of the day. It was awesome. Yeah. I was going to ask, although you just said it was awesome. If, do you feel like though that that was a little difficult for you? Because I feel like. uh, To relax. Yeah. To like actually do nothing and then not feel guilty. Um, surprisingly it wasn't, but I think if, if, if in a world where the pandemic didn't happen and I quit, that job it would have been hard it's like I mean I've never done this and I will never but when you finish running a marathon and you kind of can't (laughs) stop running at the end you have to kind of keep moving yeah I mean I think I think I eased myself into it by sort of emotionally detaching from my old job um but yeah I mean when you when you have a creative job you can't help but find inspiration around, especially if you change your location. So going to Hawaii and, you know, the colors everywhere are just, you don't see that in Southern California. It's very beige and orange here. Um, So, yeah, I mean, of course my brain's working, but it was working in a different way. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I was just wondering because sometimes, I mean, that's really good. I, I, can I ask like, well, do you feel like you ever had a problem? You would have, like a previous version of yourself might have had an issue relaxing like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I I, I am definitely, I'm a workaholic for sure. And How do and, you, sorry, how do you no, feel no, like um, what has helped you get to like that point that you are at now? Um, so I'm not there, but I can, mm. I can, um. <laughs> I can give the advice that's easier to say than to follow. But um, I actually just yesterday had a a meeting with someone who's somewhat of like a mentor, business mentor of mine. Um, And she was telling me about the importance of a morning routine that Mm -hmm. has nothing to do with your work, you know, especially if your work involves being creative um, because you got to get the juices flowing, you know? So my routine is, you know, I wake up at a certain time, take a shower. I listen to this particular news podcast while I make my bed and then sit out, let the dogs out and sit outside with coffee. And it's very simple, but, um, it does enough to sort of like wake up your brain and get you physically moving. And, 
Um, because it is so easy to wake up and reach for your phone and immediately open your email. Or even now, a lot of my work is on social media. So opening TikTok or whatever, and you get lost in comments and, you know, there's always more to do. So I've started scheduling my lunch into my calendar every day to remind myself to eat lunch. <laughs> like You just mm-hmm. have to peel yourself away because burnout, like we said, burnout is really real. And, um, and also if you have a creative job as an artist or a musician or a fashion designer, whatever it is, you can consider these excursions as almost like a mental or like emotional write off, like going to taking, taking half a day to go to a museum or go to a concert or, you know, go, go buy yourself a, a nice, you know, splurge on a coffee table book and flip through it for a couple hours. Like those things may feel like <clears throat> not productive, which sometimes I have stress about not being productive, but they are, they're, they're refilling the cup that you then Mm -hmm. pour from. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I haven't read the book, but I don't know if you've read the artist way by, I think Julia Cameron. Um, I just know this because I've seen like other people talk about it. I know a lot of people love it though. Yeah. I guess there's this thing she talks about in there called like artist dates, where it's kind of like what you were talking about. You take yourself out on a date basically for you to like have something like enjoyable and creative for you to kind of like refill your tank and get inspiration. So, you know, like you said, reading a book you like or going to, you know, a museum, stuff like that. I need to read that book. Yeah, (laughs) it's so important. It's so important. You know, there's actually something I I thought that my experience in comedy was not going to translate into what I currently do. Um, But along the way, it's translated in so many ways. And and a good example of that is is when comedians get too famous and too busy in comedy, Mm -hmm. they become less funny because they have less real life to pull from. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like I've met comedians that when they are, you know, working at Starbucks during the day and they live in the basement of some old lady they found on Craigslist and then they're doing shows at night, they are really fucking funny. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if I can curse. Oh, yeah, show, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, like the fodder from their life is excellent. But then when they, you know, hang out with only other comedians and they start getting work as a comedian I mean obviously that's the goal for them but they need to also experience life in order Mm -hmm. to have anything to pull from and it's the same as an artist if you're just thinking about your art you know 24 7 and and you're especially you know in a lockdown situation you're just staring at the same four walls all day every day you have to put yourself in another situation and honestly sometimes at least for comedy, it was like, put yourself in a weird social situation, go to an event you wouldn't normally want to go to. Like just, you have to break out of your bubble a little bit in order to react to it in a creative way. Yeah. That was actually thinking about that a couple of weeks ago. Cause I've been trying to, um, I want to make more like comics. So it's the same idea where awesome. sometimes I'm like, I have like a bunch of ideas, but then sometimes I'm like when I'm actually trying to think of something, which, you know, I'm still playing with like how I get my ideas down Um, because I feel like when I'm not thinking about it, they're all in my head. And then when I'm like, Mm -hmm. I have this the time to like actually like at least sketch them and put them down, then I can't remember them. Um, But yeah, sometimes I wonder, I'm like, dang, like how do people who like, you know, do something like this for like their whole creative career how how do they do it like yeah like you said because it's kind of hard to pull if you're not also just like living life or doing other stuff yeah do you carry um do you carry a notebook well I mean honestly I'm not even going out that much right now so like basically I do have like a notebook accessible to me all the time and I do have like a little sketchbook in my purse it's just like I guess I'm not used to yet. Say, for example, I'm like washing the dishes and I'm like thinking of stuff. I won't prioritize like, oh, let me stop and go put this idea down. I'm like, 
okay, let me you finish have to, doing this. You have this. to write it down the yeah, second. Yeah, I think I need you to change to, that. Yeah. Or even, um, you know, voice notes. Um, I don't know. I've heard a lot of people say that. And I've always been like, well, not always. I feel like that's been a recommendation I've like gotten even from like when I did therapy, like from my therapist, like to uh, you can use the voice notes in a lot of ways. And then I always forget. So I don't know. I need to figure something out. I do use my notes app a lot. Um, so it's getting better. But yeah. 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 And then you can, you know, maybe schedule into your calendar like an hour each week to kind of feel, sort through all of your you know, half ideas and, yeah. um, like I, when I was doing comedy, I was always, I would always get ideas when I was driving and then mm-hmm. I would be like, Siri, make a note. Picture uh-huh. this. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I need to turn, I don't have my Siri turn on because like I didn't want it. So I've had iPhones like for a long time and I've always been like, sometimes I would get annoyed by Siri yeah, so I never she's always it. popping up when she doesn't yeah. need to be. But for stuff like that, I feel like it's it would be amazing. Mm-hmm. No, it is helpful. And then sometimes you'll look back and be like, what the hell was I even <laughs> thinking? But, you know, it may not be. And with yeah. the getting getting out of your house thing, like maybe, maybe it needs to be a conscious decision, almost like an assignment to yourself to mm-hmm. spend, you know do something out of your comfort zone every week yeah that is also something that I especially now that the pandemic is kind of like the restrictions are there's a lot more events and stuff um I am starting to like start to go like to different events and stuff so yeah hopefully and even you know when you're spending time I don't know editing an episode of your podcast or something like that like just say today I'm gonna do this in a coffee shop that I've never been to Mm, mm -hmm. I've actually started going to the libraries too especially because it's really hot obviously and summer's coming and my apartment is like we have like portable AC but you know I don't want to use then the electric bill's gonna go up so yeah that (laughs) is also something that I'm starting to do so Cool, yeah, cool. honestly, the library is something that I feel like I forgot about as an adult. And I know, it's right? sick. They have everything. Yeah, and it's like free Wi-Fi. You can like move around. They can't, I mean, no one's going to bother I, I, you. They have so much stuff there. Like, you know, you can get, if you have like the library app, you can get like mm. the New York Times or whatever yeah. every day. And they have... um. I mean, I'm ne- will never be doing this, but if you're like selling your house and you need to stage it, they have art that you can rent and from the oh, library wow. and like put up in your house or if you're filming something or whatever. Um, and then I, I use the, that. Do you use the app Libby? Yes, I love. I love Libby. <laughs> and they have audiobooks yeah. too. Yes. Cool. I always listen to audiobooks on like 1.5 speed, and I'm like <laughs> <laughs> struggling to keep up. That's funny. Cool. Um, so I also wanted to ask you, which you kind of mentioned it briefly in the beginning about the like history and like family connections and like culture history that ties into your designs. Um, yeah, because I've seen like some of your posts, like, like you, one of your grandparents like worked at a textile, was it a textile mill? And some, some of the other ones like had different, like, occupations relating to fabric and fashion yeah um yeah and all of that is just super interesting to me so if can you talk a little bit about that definitely um so my family is quite political um lefter than you think um and my family history has been one of activism it's just something really important um in my family, uh, and, and always has been. And, um, I am super interested in, I've always loved history. Um, and I'm, I'm super interested in the way we present ourselves 
through what we wear and what we look like having some sort of political undertones. Like, for example, you know, nowadays, if you see someone two streets away and you can tell they're wearing a red baseball cap, like I get nervous, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Because there are political connotations and, and it makes me wonder when will that change? Will it ever change? And when did wearing tie dye mean that you were anti-war when in the twenties it was like a hobby for thrifty women or whatever? Um, So a lot of the textiles that I use are based around, like I said, forms of counterculture. So tie-dye is an obvious one. Um, I do a lot of stuff with checkerboard and which is obviously quite a trendy thing right now, but there is um, lots of history through like the English revival of the Jamaican rude boys, which is what my um, company is actually named after. And the checkerboard mm. was a, an indicator of um, like the merging, but also respecting of black and white cultures under like a Thatcher era Britain. Mm-hmm. And that's what a lot of ska music comes from. So I don't know if you're familiar with like the Vans checkerboard, all of that is like a reference to that um, political movement of integration. Mm-hmm. Um, so my family um like I said my parents are punk rockers and the family member that worked in a textile industry was my great grandmother um Dorothy she's got a thick New York accent and um she was 14 or 13 Mm. and she worked in a textile mill and um my dad's side of the family that's what she's on uh, are Jewish but she was I think she looked Italian according to my family I don't know what, what that means but it meant that they didn't think she could speak Yiddish. So she was a child that worked in a textile mill that was um, run by uh, Jewish people that were talking about underpaying and et cetera. And then she would eavesdrop and mm. go back to the union office and report. Uh, she was awesome. Um, wow, yeah. Yeah, there's some more intense stories as well. Like, yeah, I think this story is awesome, but it sometimes makes people go like, what the hell? She um, she was part of a group of women in the um, 1920s that in the early in 1910s during the like um, a lot of unionization of like mm-hmm. um, child labor laws were being made for the first time ever. Workers rights, things like that, uh, all under like a socialist umbrella. And she had a big up hair updo. And she would have weapons in it Mm -hmm. that she would walk into a crowd of male protesters that had already been frisked by the police. And she would pull like pins and knives out of her hair and hand it to them in secret. So she was like a badass. (laughs) It's crazy, right? She's crazy. Um, So she was sort of a revolutionary um, and a card carrying communist. And so was her husband. And then my grandmother was part of the McCarthy hearings um as a communist and um you know i mean we don't have to get too political about it but i've talked to her a lot about it about you know communism in russia in in practice versus marxism as a philosophy and Mm -hmm. she talks about how you know they didn't know about the gulags and a lot of stalinist practices um you know for her it was really uh about world peace and um trying to fight the use of the hydrogen bomb. That's what she thought she was fighting for. And she was pretty devastated to learn that there was harm going on because the idea of, you know, in theory, Marxism is quite a wonderful thing. Um, Anyway, that's quite complicated, but she, she was a a dancer um, and then she was a weaver and she would, she was a ballerina that would hand out little communist manifesto, pamphlets after her shows <laughs> so then so cool. you know my, my dad who's then gen x um is perhaps a little bit less political but he lived in that like um autonomous society in denmark that like doesn't have police or anything in it. it's like an anarchist society but now mm-hmm. he's just my dad he's like a regular <laughs> guy <laughs> um so you know the the activism and the intensity of it and the sort of like putting your body on the line all mm-hmm. of that um, has withered away with generations, but it is part of my blood and, you know, just super important, I think, to use your privilege to speak for people that can't 
And so I, I love learning about that and the sort of like reference about it and the sort of like intellectual musing. And that's a lot of what goes on between behind my like fabric choices. But um, I've also tried to be careful about practicing what I preach in terms of working with a factory and, you know, working with making sure that the people who are making my clothes are paid well and they get mm-hmm. paid sick leave and they get maternity leave and they get a break, you know? Yeah. Um, because it's so easy to say all that. Um, and to, you know, I've got my inspo photos on Instagram of like hippies and whatever, but if I'm not practicing that, um, if I'm not being ethical and sustainable in my practices, then what's the point? Yeah. That's all of that was, is like super interesting. And it's super cool that you, um, are able to like know these stories about your ancestors too. Yeah. Um, I'm lucky. Cause it, it, uh, I feel like it, I don't know if you could say this is true, but I'm sure it makes like your decision making now, like more, I don't know, like the word for it, but I could just see how like that is very in the like forefront of your mind when you're like making your decisions for your shop um, and how important like all of that is to you and to your business. Um, yeah, it really does. Cool. It does um, help me to, you know, if I feel overwhelmed or I'm not sure what kind of a decision to make, it is, you know, we talk a lot about how like ancestral trauma is a mm-hmm. thing, um, generational trauma, but there's also like generational and ancestral like guidance in all of us. Mm-hmm. So there's like a pause, there's positive um, sort of like ephemeral things that we just know in ourselves too. So I don't obviously know my great grandmother, um, I don't know anything about her, but, um, besides, you know, the stories, I don't know what she was like as a person, but I do feel a connection to Mm -hmm. what I believe her purpose was and what she cared about. And it's nice to have that sort of like reframing of, of what's important. Yeah. Cool. Would you be able to kind of like go through your, I guess, like creative process and like the process of maybe like creating a from like design or idea to final product of a dress definitely so it's actually good timing because I've been looking through uh, tomorrow I'm doing on Instagram like a little sale of all the like wonky messed up I saw you post about that yeah (laughs) yeah I mean I I love them they're all little weirdos but um it does just take a lot of trial and error so you you know with with it, it usually starts with fabric for me, mm. color and touch. And, um, I, you know, after doing research or whatever, which I just do on the side of like, you know, it just gives me a, a broad framework, gingham or checker or whatever. There's a million options in there, different types of fabric, you know, the sizing, the color, all that. So, um, I really focus on how it feels and just kind of what speaks to me. And then I do a lot of like, just laying things on top of each other. How does this look next to this? And then um, I use a lot of vintage patterns to start and then I adjust as I go. So I'll trace around a vintage, maybe like sleeve cap and then say, actually I want it to hang this way. So I'll I'll kind of intuitively change things. And um, I try to, as much as I can not waste like, good fabric and use like a old Ikea bed sheet or something first. Um, but sometimes you just got to go for it. And then I, you know, will put something on, try it on a million times during the process and hold it up to the mirror and, you know, pull this way, pull that way. It's hard to explain though. I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way in your art of like, you just sometimes, sometimes like your eyes cross and you're you you just black out and you just are in the zone um yeah so I try to you know I I spend a lot of time on on Pinterest and you know reading articles and things like that looking at photos and taking in the inspiration but I'm not ever actively you know holding up a photo from 1960 and saying okay let's create this thing it's sort of like I've just uploaded to my subconscious and Mm -hmm. then I'm listening to a true crime podcast or whatever and just going and it's all sort of like subconsciously informing Mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah 
Yeah, that's cool too. That um, do you ever have moments where you feel like stuck? Oh my gosh, yes, all the time. Especially when I when I can't technically execute. Mm. I'm just not skilled enough to execute what is in my mind um, because I didn't go to fashion school. I yeah, I was wondering about that too because since like you've said that you know you only have a couple of years of actual like garment sewing experience what what is that like simultaneously learning (laughs) yeah like the techniques while also trying to develop your stuff it's super frustrating sometimes um but also it I don't know what I don't know so Mm -hmm. I have taken risks in my work that I didn't know were risky because you know then I talk to someone like at the garment factory I'll, I'll say something and they'll be like you did what on the hell <laughs> we don't usually recommend that like that can go yeah. wrong and I'm like well it didn't so I didn't know or <clears throat> for example I was using these zippers and someone at the factory was like those zippers are for jeans not for dresses and I'm like okay so who cares? Like, yeah. I like the way they look. And they're like, well, they're not really made for that. And I'm like, why? You know, so um, it's a blessing. And it kind of yeah, kind of works to your advantage in a way. Totally. But no, there are definitely I mean, you'll see if you look at my stuff. It's all quite simple. <laughs> I have a similar because I so I have like the podcast and then I have like YouTube videos and I use um, Adobe Premiere Pro. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it's similar where I I just started like doing it on my own. You know, I've never been in like a class for it and stuff. And I'll watch like YouTube videos here and there when I really don't know how to do something. But it's kind of the same thing where like I know what my maybe what my end product needs to be. And I'm, like I'll do yeah. something like just whatever the heck. And then like I'll watch a video on it later. And there's like the like actual way or like different actual ways to do it. And it's just. But it, it can be really overwhelming, too. So I can imagine, like, because I've sewn a couple of things, too. And my my mom is actually, she's, like, sewn quilts all her life. Oh, um, cool. Growing up, like, all of our quilts and blankets were made by her. Oh, that's so sweet. So I get to see her, like, right now. I actually, she hasn't made me a blanket, um, which, you know, she doesn't have to. But she hasn't made me, like, my own <laughs> quilt since I was, like, uh in eighth grade and I still have that quilt it's actually like a checkerboard quilt because I was obsessed with checkered when I was in middle school so so anyway I saw this little did you know you were a radical exactly (laughs) um I saw this quilt in a clip from a show that I didn't end up watching but it was set in some I, I think it was like colonial United States and, you know, they were showing clips of women's quilts. And there was this one that that I discovered later was called, like, the Tree of Life pattern. Mm. So I asked my mom if she would make me a quilt now with that pattern. And so she's, like, going through. She's, like, trying to source the patterns, but also trying to, like, figure it out on her yeah. own. So it's super cool to see that with uh, fabric as well with her, like, doing that for me. Yeah, that's so awesome. And it's such an example of like textile being something so meaningful. I think Mm -hmm. partially, you know, especially with women throughout history of quilting. I mean, the the idea of making a blanket for someone is like gifting them comfort Mm -hmm. and protection and warmth. It's like the most wonderful and loving thing that you can do for someone. That's so awesome. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, So I know that you said that you're prepping for your newest collection. So could you ca- talk about like what does like a collection entail? Yeah. You and like what is your vision for this collection? Totally. Um, So it's different for everyone. And that's kind of an example as well of me not knowing what the hell I'm doing. It's like, <laughs> you, know, pe- you know, big brands will have fall and spring summer and resort collections and whatever that means and I just am gonna have it when I'm ready and that's Mm -hmm. fine um so for this upcoming collection it is about six pieces each one of them has somewhat of a story behind it um in the textile 
So it ranges from something inspired by this like Japanese fairy tale to um, I have something in a railroad stripe and I ha- talk, I've talked a lot about, um, you know, the importance of, of the railroads in the 1800s. And then I have something named after the first human cannonball, which was a 17 year old girl oh. named Zazzle, who I love. And oh, wow. um, so it, it's, it's a little bit reminiscent of like my brain being all over the place and being interested in lots of different things. And I think there's going to be something for everybody, but it, it the essence of it, of, of the pieces. So I, I thought a lot about, I'm dealing with this right now, which is like, you don't want the story to sell the product. You want the product to sell itself. And then the story mm-hmm. is just like a, uh, a nice addition. Um, but people aren't going to buy something for the story. They need to like what it looks like and feels like. So it's important for me that everything is super comfortable. It's a full outfit in one. You just kind of throw it on and you look sick. And <laughs> it's also very loud and like you want to be perceived, but it has nothing to do with the male gaze. You know, they're, mm-hmm. uh, the tops are quite masculine in t-shirts, but then it's quite flouncy and you can be feminine and pretty and dressed up um, without wanting negative attention. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's a pretty easygoing pretty easygoing collection with fun stories behind it and lots of loud colors. And there's always lots of plaids in what I do. Um, my mom's side of the family is Scottish. So, and there's a lot of like rebellion history there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, so what it entails in terms of creating it is sourcing fabric first and then playing around with shapes. Um, this is the first time I'm working with a factory. So, um, I say factory, but it's like three ladies in a room it's not really a factory Mm -hmm. um and uh I put together samples and I go talk to them about different trims and I source zippers and threads and we work on the patterns and I get the samples and then I wear them around and I say actually let's change this actually let's add this I like to add more like like a change I made recently was I wanted to add more visible stitching like they were Mm. too good do you know what I mean? And I kind of like the like maker's mark yeah. of something. It's like when you get a piece of handmade pottery and you can see like a yeah. thumbprint in it. I yeah. love that. Me too. Um, yeah. So I wanted that to be incorporated. And then there's all the the next bit of creativity. Um, you know, the, this job sort of oscillates between a creative part and then a administrative part and then back and forth. So the next creative part is gonna be like a marketing. Um taking photos and designing the aesthetic of that. And then, I don't know, pushing product all day, every day, and hopefully (laughs) people like it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I'm excited to see those pieces when you start sharing them on social media. Well, I just have one more question for you, which is, depending on your answer, may or may not be related to art and creativity. Um, and I know you kind of like mentioned your hobbies and stuff earlier. It's just what do you like to do for fun currently? Yeah. Um, I like to go to karaoke. <laughs> um, I like to, we've been, my partner and I have been gardening mm. a little bit lately. Um, I have two little puppy poodles that I'm obsessed with. So I play with them all day, every day. They're puppies right now? Yeah, well, they just turned two. We just had a birthday oh, okay. party for them. I was like, ah. <laughs> um, well, there's, I'm sure they're still cute. It's just the, uh, yeah, they still act like yeah dummies. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I think I think because things have been so busy in the first year of running a business, my mm-hmm. my break really has been for fun. Honestly, is like listening to a podcast that has nothing to do with work, and then walking to a coffee shop and getting a fancy latte (laughs) whatever if it's lavender I want it um Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then yeah sitting outside and being with my little family um but otherwise yeah karaoke is the shit I always do a green day song um do you go to like karaoke bars or you do it like at home or both. Oh, karaoke bars I like to go to I like the ones where you have like a separate little room like in Koreatown Uh huh. I've never actually been to a karaoke bar, but I like seeing people go to them. 
Oh so I feel like that's you gotta come with us. <laughs> yeah, um, you gotta come with us. It's also the best when there's someone who like did not want to go to karaoke, and then they <laughs> end up like being the it. one that's so into it. That's the best. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I had a when I was like, I don't know how old I was. I was in elementary school, maybe like eight or something. I asked for a karaoke machine for my for my birthday, <laughs> and I got it. And then I just remember like just using it all the time that's so cute. probably annoying my older siblings whatever it's fun <laughs> <laughs> cool cool well um that's all the questions that i have for you thank you so much again for taking your time to talk to me talk about your work and your experience and all that um of course thanks yeah. for having me it was great all right. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. Make sure to check out Shop Beauty on Instagram and TikTok. I'll leave those links in the show notes as well as her website where you can place an order. And just another reminder that listeners can get a free sticker by leaving a written review on Apple Podcasts for the show. I'll make sure to leave those instructions in the show notes as well. Make sure to also subscribe if you're not already. And yeah, thank you so, so much for listening. I hope that you have a wonderful week.